Well, thank you for Tamaris Coalition for inviting me to talk about our work here at Colorado Mesa University. Um, and today I want to talk to you about our work um, involving the Coniades species. Uh, and I'm very glad that I actually had a uh, chance on this. Um, so, first thing to know, these weevils are not native to North America. They are their natural habitat origin is Eurasia. They're found everywhere from the Mediterranean region all the way to Siberia and Western China. Um, however, we see them. Okay? The first sighting started in 2006 uh, in Arizona, and then since then we've been seeing them in Southern California, in Utah, in Colorado. We started seeing them in 2011. Uh, in 2011, the um, Nevada um, scientists have started citing them at the Coniatus splendigilis. Uh, there are actually 12 species in the genus of Coniatus, um, and they're all believed to be natural predators of tamarisk species. Now, out of those uh, 12 species, uh, three of them have been actually studied and evaluated as uh, biological control agents, possible biological control agents. The splendigilis species is pretty small, it's about three millimeters, and its native range ranges um, from the Mediterranean to Iraq, Caucasus, and even up to Siberia. So if you look at the map over here, they have a big natural habitat that they're from. Now, the interesting thing is, even though those three species were studied as biological control agents, as we know, there have been no known intentional releases of these weevils made. Okay? So we think what we have here is some unintentional or accidental introductions, maybe due to um, nurseries bringing in, you know, pots of plants from overseas and these guys being in the leaf litter, nobody notices them and they get around. So, that brings me to what we are doing and are pursuing uh, in our studies. Basically, we went out to find out the origins of the species that we have here in uh, North America and match them using DNA markers to their origin in uh, Eurasia. Uh, our other uh, study was to see if the Coniata species that we find here are the result of a single introduction, meaning there was one accidental introduction, then they spread around, or did we have several introductions made? Um, and then lastly, I'm going to spend some time to talk about what we've learned about the life cycle of this weevil um, during our studies this last past summer. Okay, so let's start out with the matching of Coniatus that we find here in North America to the, um, uh, spe uh, to the populations found in Eurasia. So for this study, what we did was we had specimens collected in U.S., so we collected some here in Grand Junction in town, and then Tom Dudley uh, kindly sent us some from Santa Clara, Utah, some Mesquite, Nevada, Cottonwood Creek, Arizona. And then um, Dr. Massimo Cristofaro from BBCA uh, collected some from his field sites in central or northeastern Turkey in Avanos, Sivas, and Tarjan. And we've used these samples for this study. We do have some, uh, some specimens collected from Italy, but they were not included in this study yet because of um, technical issues, but we are moving forward with that. So when the specimens were collected, they were stored in 90 to 100% ethanol, and as soon as we got them in the lab, we would put them in uh, minus 20 degrees. Um, for the DNA isolation, the first thing we did was to remove the abdomen to minimize the risk of contamination from uh, plant material in their GI tract. And then um, the, we used the Kygen DNA Easy uh, blood and tissue uh, DNA isolation kit to get the DNA. Now, 
From that purified DNA, from that isolated DNA, we amplified a 1.3 kilobase pair fragment of the cytochrome oxidase 1 gene. This is a mitochondrial gene, and its sequence has been used to barcode species by many scientists. Once we got the PCR done, we would uh, send it to sequencing, and then the sequences were manually aligned, and then we performed maximum parsimony analysis using the PAP soft software uh, to get our results. And these are our results. We formed a maximum parsimony consensus tree, and I'm going to walk you through this tree. Uh, the first thing I want you to notice is the samples that were collected in Turkey grouped different than the samples collected in the United States. Okay? The numbers that you see on the tree are bootstrap uh, scores, and it is indicative of the strength of the clades that are formed, like how um, confident are we that this group is really different from the other group. So the numbers are really high. You know, here I have 100, here I have a 99. So that makes me very confident to say that the weevils we have here have not come from Turkey. Okay? As a part of the analysis, we use Zyraptic here in a lot of data, uh, DNA as an out group. It's just part of the analysis. And when we compared all of these sequences, we actually found 40 parsimony informative sites. So there were a lot of variation within the, within the DNA sequence that allowed us to compare these uh, populations. So what does this mean? As I said, we know that what we have here didn't come from Turkey. What I'm planning to do is check other specimens that will be collected or have been collected in Eurasia, in uh, Western China, and see if we can find a match with these. Um, as for our second goal, we want to see if what we have here is a single, the result of a single introduction or several introductions. So f we did a very similar study just like before. Uh, in this case, we had 14 coni coniatus specimens. Nine were from here, Grand Junction, two from Cottonwood Creek, Arizona, and three from Santa Clara, Utah. When we aligned these sequences and performed the same analysis, we got only one parsimony informative site. And that basically told us, I couldn't even form a uh, tree with those because they were all so similar to each other. So when I'm focusing just on this gene, the CO1 gene, they are the same, okay? Which tells me that it's most likely that we had one introduction and they are spreading in our area, which is actually pretty amazing compared to their size and the range they have come in such short time. Okay? Now, what does it mean to have a single introduction? It means that a small number of individuals from a population have migrated or were moved against their wishes to a new environment. And that will cause a genetic bottleneck caused by a founder's effect. And in a case like that, we usually expect a low genetic variation within the population. Okay? Now, our current DNA data supports that. However, when we look at the weevils themselves, we see variation. So these are weevils collected in the same site. I have one that is metallic green, really shiny, with a little bit of brown on its back. And I have another one that's really dark and brown. Um, the, uh, our Collaborators in the, at the Palisade Insectary have found some that are gray. So we do see a lot of color morphology changes, variations. Another difference that we see is their pupil cases. Okay? So in this case, you can see an adult just eating its way out of the pupil case. And it is very densely woven. You cannot even see inside. And these are usually lighter in color than these guys. Okay, so you can actually see through these. We could actually watch those pupa undergoing metamorphosis. Okay. So when I look at the phenotype of these weevils, I'm saying, well, maybe they are multiple introductions um, that brought so much variation into the um, North America populations. Now, what I'm seeing 
could be due to two things. One of them is, yes, there were multiple introductions and they have different phenotypes and that's why we see this. And when I look at CO1, that doesn't do justice. Maybe I have to look at other DNA sequences, maybe some nuclear genes. Uh, the other possibility is maybe these phenotypes that we're seeing are results of different environmental factors. Maybe heat, maybe uh, their exposure to sun, maybe how much food they got to eat, maybe all of these affect these phenotypes that we see. We don't know the answer right now. We're very interested to find these out. All right, now I'm gonna talk about our studies that we did this summer uh, looking at this weevil and trying to figure out its life cycle. What we did was we collected those pupa cases because they're really easy to find on the plants and we brought them to the Palisade insect tree and stored them or incubated them at incubators at 25 degrees Celsius constant. It's a 14 hour light, 10 hour dark light cycles. That light cycle corresponds approximately to late May to early June, what we see here in Grand Junction. Now, once the adults emerged out of those pupil cases, we removed them, put them in new clear plastic containers with fresh foliage, and maintained them. We would change the foliage every day or every other day. Every time the foliage was taken out, it was searched, looked for eggs and finding eggs was a big task because they hide their eggs. They lay them one by one. So if you have worked with Diarabda, you can find their eggs like this because they will lay them in bunches, they will be on the branches. What these guys do, well, ladies, these ladies actually will go and bite off the tip of the buds and then they will lay the egg in there, a single egg. It's like a little nest. And we actually found that helps those larvae because when they hatch, they have a little nest that they can hang out and start eating from there. Um, so what you see here is an egg that was just laid. They're pretty small. They're about half a millimeter in length. I cannot see them with my naked eye. I need these or I need the dissecting microscope to see them. Um, they, as I said, they do lay them inside, however, we sometimes do find them on the outside, but that's usually if they're overcrowded or if they don't have enough foliage in the container. What we see is originally they are yellow, like yolk color, but within 24 hours they start changing color. They usually start darkening from one end, and after another 24 hours the whole egg is dark colored. And we found that this color change is indicative of uh, developing larvae. The eggs that never changed to black and stayed yellow never hatched. Okay, and here I just want you to see, I don't know if you can see it because of the thing, but they are really hard to find. And I, there's one hiding here and another one hiding here. And I had to hold the thing just so, so we can see them. An interesting thing is we noticed that if Within the foliage, there were flowers available. The ladies laid their eggs in the flower buds. So you can't see them. There is one there, another one hiding there, one here, there is one there. And when the larvae hatch, do you see them? There's one, 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 one. They start eating the flower buds. So that made us think that maybe one of the ways the coniatus can control tamarisk is by lowering their seed production. Okay, so once the eggs hatch about five to seven days after uh, being laid, um, the larvae, the larvae come out. The first instar larvae are yellow, just the color of the egg initially. They're really small, about 0.7 millimeters. They have a black head and they're really cute. After 24 hours, they molt into second instar larvae, and this time they have become light green. And I'm suspecting that comes from the green tamarisk foliage that they're eating. Um, after a few days, they uh, molt into third instar larvae. We do not know if there are four or five. We do know at least one, two, three, and I'm calling this the final 
um, in star larvae uh, because it was really hard to follow them to molt in the containers that we were doing it. Um, the, so they, they get bigger with each molting, you know, 0 0.7, 1.2, 1.5 to 2 millimeters. And when they're in final instar, they about, they're about 3 millimeters or so, okay? Um, their coloration changes. The big ones are pretty dark in color. They do have dorsal stripes, and they do have little um, black spots on them. Now, I do not have a movie, but I want you to, to see how these guys eat the foliage. So I have one larva right here. It just finished eating this leaf down here, and it's going to go up to go to the tip, and then it will start eating from the top down. So you can see, moves, 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 and gets to the top. Okay? You can see over here the crass that they left behind when it ate down. And that was actually the easiest way to find these weevils. I would just look at the damaged foliage and down there it would be because they camouflage really well. Now, after the larval stages, uh, we got into the pupa. And the, here is a larva that is wo weaving its pupal case. Here is a uh, pupa, pupal case that gets usually attached pretty tightly to a, a branch point on the foliage. We can see the larvae in these undergoing metamorphosis or pupa at this stage. Uh, they are quite responsive to light and heat. Um, I think they do get disturbed when it gets too hot or too light. They start moving and vibrating. Uh, over here, I have a pupa that fell off from a pupil case that wasn't very well formed. And we actually followed this all the way through adulthood. It was really amazing to watch it step by step. Okay, so after about five to seven days, the adult come out, they eat their pupil case and come out. They feed on the uh, foliage. They really like to go to the tips. As a matter of fact, if you can see here, there's one adult burying its head to the tip of the, uh, to the bud of the foliage. And when I watch them under the microscope, they actually remind me of my daughters eating watermelon in the summer. They're like, ah, eating like that. Um, <clears throat> an interesting thing that we found is these weevils are very long lived. The weevils that emerged in June are still alive. They're kicking and well and eating. This is not usual. The diarabda perinolata will you know, emerge, it will be sexually active, and in about six weeks or so they will senesce. We do not see this, okay? Um, so that was really interesting. Um, so in the whole, the whole life cycle takes about 35 days, uh, but then they do stay um, alive for a pretty long time. Now, in two days, there will be a, a field trip to the Stalisate insect tree. Right now, they have an infestation of these weevils in their uh, greenhouse. So if you've never seen them and would like to see them, stop by. I strongly suggest they are really beautiful critters. So that brings me to my acknowledgments. I would like to thank CMU, the biology department, for letting me use the lab space and the um, equipment for the DNA work and the um, academic affairs for funding my um, research in the last three years. I also would like to thank Colorado Department of Agriculture, Palisade Insect Tree for allowing to use their um, incubators and the know-how. Nina Loudon, Sonia Ortega, and Karen Rosen have been very, very helpful uh, uh, for maintaining these uh, cultures. The Cuneatis collections were done by Tom Dudley at UC Santa Barbara and Massimo Cristofaro at BBCA in Italy, and also by my daughters, Denise and Ada. As a matter of fact, here they are in Grand Junction collecting those people cases that we ended up using in our study. And here we're in Turkey, and we spent two days of our summer vacation looking for Cuneatis in Turkey at the drainages. Um, and then I could have not done these without the help of my undergraduate students. Austin Hadley, he is here today in the audience. He was responsible for the life study project. And then Amanda Stalke and Catherine Woodard will also be here today uh, at the poster session. They were uh, uh, 
functional in the DNA work, uh, and Amanda also helped me with the um, sequence analysis. So I will stop here and take any questions. Oh, question? Not that we know of. We are very interested in looking in that. The three species that were studied before were pretty specific to tamarins, but we do not know which one this is. So that's a good question to ask. Yes? Uh, given that they're around for eight months, uh, now, what's their name uh, of That's a really good question. So first of all, they wouldn't be around for eight months because when the winter comes and the plant defoliates, they do go down to the leaf litter. Those were lab conditions. In terms of egg laying, we have been following them for months and looking, finding eggs, and we were very excited about it. But then we realized that the foliage that we were bringing in could have coniatus eggs from the field. So I don't know the answer to that. We are working on this for this season. We're going to hopefully grow some tamarisk in our greenhouse without any coniatus and then use those to do the study. That's a very good question. <clears throat> any other questions? All right, thank you.